All right, well, welcome everybody. As most um, meetings, we do have some guest speakers. Um, and today we have the pleasure of first up, Senator Jeremy McPike, who, so you know, spent his life in Prince William County attending Vaughn Elementary, Fredland Middle, and graduating from Garfield High School. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and now is a uh, Virginia Senate representing the 29th District. He's going to share some information about our latest bill. Thank you, Michelle, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's like a Monday, post Labor Day, but it's Tuesday, so everyone's going through that reorientation right from the long weekend. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come and say hello and also hear from you on the work that you're doing, uh, and I'd love sort of continuous feedback. Um, I also serve, perfect timing, Susanna. I also serve on the state's SOL Innovation Committee which uh, congratulations to Susanna on the governor's appointment last week to the committee, so congratulations. Um, there are a number of different things that the Board of Education, that many in this room are already familiar with, that has been going on for the last couple of years, one of which is high school redesign. Uh, the Board of Ed Education had an outreach session about two years ago um, here, here in Manassas <coughs> to build a profile of a graduate and one of the key components that I was really interested in the high school redesign was giving kids credit for real world experience in their junior and senior year of high school. And so the Board of Education has started to adopt and um, provide a framework to allow that to happen. And then school boards and others are starting to take a look at those guidelines and start to adapt. So Senate Bill 644 was a part of that over sort of several years of taking a look at the issues. And sometimes the state rules also constrain and so uh, Senate Bill 644, 664, which passed this year, really took a look at the uh, credit hour requirement. You have 140 hours that are required for coursework. And one of the things in feedback I you know, heard from around the Commonwealth was, well, if we're done with the coursework, we're still sort of clocking hours. What else can we do to be more flexible? And that's really what this bill does. It allows uh, localities to adopt industry certifications you name it. There's lots of certifications that can be done within a day, two days, a week, two weeks, that anyone who's a parent like I am, I've got one in high school, one in middle school, one in elementary school, you know that at the end of the year, there's, there's sort of, you crank through your coursework um, by April, May, and you've got that May, June. And so it really is an opportunity uh, to make sure that school boards and localities can be nimble and flexible have a waiver to the Board of Education in place that they're going to institute a program that fits their local needs. Uh, and there's various uh, industry uh, needs, requirements all across Virginia. This is just a flexible way that local school boards can adapt once they've identified uh, and cert certificate programs uh, that are available. Sometimes it's partnering with local industry. Uh, sometimes it's school boards stepping up and, and identifying things that they can do themselves. Uh, and really, it's my hope that it's a partnership sort of in the same vein of high school redesign, where you are engaging the Chamber of Commerce, you are engaging maybe a local industry leader in the workforce development. And I think this is a lot what this committee is engaged in as well, which is great. So from a Commonwealth standpoint, we're hoping to continue to build this sort of relationship and strengthen. And some communities have really strong bonds and others don't have strong. And so hopefully this is a you know, vehicle where you can have much more flexible and dynamic uh, interaction uh, with the locality and business. So that's a overall summary. Um, Susanna's about to jump into the SOL. I think the next meeting is coming up in you know, three or four weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and we're starting sort of a, a new round. We've done a significant amount of work to uh, reprogram some of the SOLs to identify um, verified credits, dual enrollment, other sort of tests that we are already having our kids take to apply those credits to essentially the, the SOL equivalents. So we've been trying to narrow those down. Not all the committee members agree on how to get there. Um, I'm not a big fan of uh, watching my three girls go through anxiety tests at one o'clock, you know, anxiety attacks at one o'clock in the morning. It's gonna be fine, you'll test fine. And I've heard a lot of the same uh, uh, stories from other parents. So uh, we're continuing to work uh, in that area and uh, more, more to come. 
So happy to have uh, Zuzanna on the team. So uh, with that, uh, Madam Chair, I'd love to open up questions. I, so the, the 140 hours is a requirement that you have to use and you can't do nothing else in that time? Yeah, that basically it's, 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 it's basically math to math that has to apply within 140 hours. This now allows much more dynamic flexibility across coursework. So you don't have to do the alignment if you've completed. It allows the school board to be much more flexible versus sort of stove piping, this must fit in this one category. Okay. Coffee's still working, like I said, it's sort of this Monday Tuesday <laughs> thing going on. So this is a, a state, state initiative that's been passed, right? Yes, yeah, the governor signed it in the law, so local school boards, since it's just come into effect July 1, school boards haven't quite caught up. And a lot of times those things will take, you know, a year or two for the word to get out that, hey, we've got this tool in the toolbox and to now utilize, how do we take advantage of it? So what is it that the school board can do, I guess, to um, kind of fall in line as far as what you guys have set up? Like, what is it that our school board can do to allow um, the students to be able to uh, fall in line and make sure it's fine. Like, what is it that, what's kind of like the process like for them? To, is it just a simple uh, vote to um, adopt it or how, yeah. does that, how does it work? At it least gives the local school, school board's process in terms of identifying um, what certifications, what partnerships exist, and then they would have to adopt, um, you know, through a vote, what framework they're going to pursue. Or they, you know, might, you know, allow a superintendent to have a flexible portfolio of things that like they'd like to see. Uh, pursued. Gotcha. I got a question. So I'd like to hear some people from the school schools. I mean, how you know, all my kids have been growing out of school forever. I have <laughs> grandkid down there, but <laughs> I mean, the but how important is it? I don't see anybody like, oh, you know, it's kind of cool. I mean, how important is it to I mean, the people um, that are in school? I would yeah. say the stress level that you mentioned is yeah. extreme. Yeah. Um, for example, under testing situations, kids. As a substitute at one point, even though I have a, a master's degree in education mm -hmm. and I'm all the dissertation and a PhD, um, I had to, they were told to give mints to the children that would help them score higher. <laughs> and I had to, as a substitute, perform a Heimlich maneuver on one of the students. And on the playground, she came up and gave me a hug, but then that's not allowed, you know what I mean? So that's a true story. Mm -hmm. um, and also, now, rooms are freezing cold so that people will pay attention because they stayed up all night studying. You know, I could have come here and had coffee, but I have an ulcer, so I had to stop and buy a coat because I didn't didn't have time to finish making my tea at home. You know, to save the money. <laughs> See what I'm saying? You know, so I mean, and I'm a mother of a student uh, who was uh, in college and uh, su and and suffered a loss of a friend in um, Richmond and uh, was grieving. Went to a hospital in Florida. Luckily, he made it home. Thank you to. The air, you know, whoever was flying the plane and paid attention and landed safely. Mm -hmm. um, now we have what? Uh, some, you can't control the weather, so what's mm -hmm. going to happen in Florida now? I mean, I just heard on NPR that we're going to get some kind of what? Um, storm? Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> so just be careful where you travel, you know? I mean, let's, let's help each other. Well, well, one of the things that, um, you know, for the high school redesign, sort of the need question, mm -hmm. part of the question mm -hmm. was, a lot of the feedback for the state was sort of the emphasis on the four year, you have to go four year, you know, you know, four year, four year, four year, versus like, let's look at a dynamic portfolio that has real, you know, world certifications that have employability right out of the gate, mm -hmm. you know, that you can get, whether it's HVAC, that's some of my background in addition to fire services, you know, I work construction and, and still help design and, and build buildings uh, for the city of Alexandria. And so I have a need for HVAC techs, control techs, um, mechanics, you know, dealing with, you know, increasingly computerized yeah. things. And that doesn't require a four-year degree, yeah. but you can make $100,000 if you've got the sequence of certifications and controls. And there's fairly complex things yeah. that just don't require. Um, so it's really just making sure that we open up the available things and introduce them. Um, yeah, so. like through internships and things like that. Mm -hmm. That kind of opportunity yeah. is really wonderful, I think. Now, Patrick Small uh, from NASA was saying mm -hmm. you're going to have to import people for jobs here. I thought that was kind of odd, but it's, I guess it's a reality. These kind of things pop out a little bit, I think. Yeah. A lot. 
Well, that, that's the hope is, is you know, figure out what are the barriers to success, help to modify it like we did through this change in, in the code, and uh, hopefully you know, encourage this sort of dialogue and chambers of commerce across Virginia to make sure you link back in with the school systems and say, hey, you know, let's roll up the sleeves. What does our local profile of a high school graduate look like? Uh, in addition you know, to what the state's guidelines are, but what do we want to say and have as a statement? So yeah. I think it's really important. I appreciate all the work you guys are doing. I just got a question about that. It says like the 140 hours. I guess in my head I'm trying to wrap it around. Is what does that look like? Is that saying for the last month it's basically they're good for so many hours per week? Or is there other things in there that they'll have to do? That's part of the school board deciding that, that whole structure. Yeah, the, the emphasis in this change is to say you've completed all the core competencies yep. and it's not about the hour requirements. It's not about punching in anymore. It's about you got the skill sets that we wanted you to. You know, and so it's an outcome based, not a clock based. Mm -hmm. So if you've completed the work, you can, you've gone through all that curriculum, um, I just, I don't see a need to say, okay, we've got 30 more or 20 more or 10 more, you know, whatever that is, to then continue something that you've mastered the material in. Mm -hmm. Let's get a little bit more dynamic with our resources and our time and get kids engaged on, you know, with CPR, HVAC, could be, you know, at IT and technical skills. There's lots of things that you can bring to the table that are modulized now. They come in one day, two day, in a week long segments that a kid's coming out and has something that's right on the resume. You know, they can demonstrate a skill that's outside of the cork and they can apply into the workforce. So I think that's a, a huge advantage I wish I had going through. I would think you would be jumping up and down about we are. It's a game changer for a lot of students in career and technical education. Imagine you're a junior or a senior in high school, and like you, the senator said, you finish your competencies for that course for the year, and then that May June time frame, you're able to go out and work in that field area. Uh, it, it's huge. It's going to work real well for youth registered mm -hmm. apprentices uh, that we're a big part of. So for students that, you know, academia did not really lend itself to and they didn't find huge success there, they're finding tremendous success in skilled trades. Uh, and the skilled trades are here, right here in Prince William County. And it is great to see 16 of our 19 uh, seniors in welding, got full-time employment here in the Prince William County. That's awesome. It, the employers are here. That wave has come through. Uh, a lot of their employees are aging out of the workforce mm -hmm. and they're losing a huge skill set but it's great when you can take a young person and this allows that to happen to be mentored by someone before they you know age out retire and that kind of thing so uh, it is a, a game changer uh, it allows the businesses to see that opportunity and allows the kids to build hours uh, towards journeymen and masters uh, type of I thought it was a big deal it's so hard the kids have got to stay interested in school. Mm -hmm. Correct. Once you lose them in there, it's hard to get them back. And there's a lot of things that will do that, will, that will distract them. But if that's something that's going to inspire them and give them some opportunities, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Well, something other than and I mean, I agree. I, I just feel that uh, to see us concentrating on workforce development, you know, a lot of the uh, schools, they obviously push higher education, but that's going to be for a select group. Yeah. Not everyone's yeah. going to fall into that category. So we just have to have the mindset that degrees is what gets you in the door, but the certifications and the licenses, that's what gets you paid. And for us to be able to focus on students' achievement as far as creating that well-rounded student, having that book knowledge, of course, which is what we're talking about, but then having the applied knowledge to go along with it, that's what's going to be very, very important because that's what's going to allow that student who may be considering workforce to actually know this is exactly what I want to do as opposed to going to higher education and realizing this is not what I want to do and still have no workforce development. Yeah, I know one of my other hats I wear, I do college consulting because I have a background in college admissions. And I'll tell you, some of my biggest challenge, because I'm really pushing for this for some of the kids that I meet, uh, it's the parents. <laughs> you know, they just say, oh no, we're four year college and I'm trying to make the case. It's not a hard case to make, frankly, because the, yeah. the numbers are there. I mean, these kids, I mean, the amount of money that they make, but it's me, it's 
sometimes battling, sometimes with parents, it's about the prestige piece of saying, well, this is actually very, they do very, very well <laughs> to look at this. So that's the other piece of it that I find is something is, is a challenge. Is getting to those parents. I'm excited about some of the tools on MMS. It's started with some of the U Science early application, which I think is really exciting. Um, I'm sure you, some of some of you, <coughs> have taken a peek at it with Manassas, but I think that early identification of both aptitude and interest in middle school and very early on to say, and especially for like my three girls, um, you know, they have a much higher, you know, the data says. Um, Precluding in IT, but if you ask them where they want to go, it's like my middle daughter, it's in nursing. And other, you know, so it's just helping to identify early on the career paths, whether in what sort of areas, whether it's four year doctoral or it's trade within certain cat. I mean, just that discussion with parents early on, I think, is also a huge tool that we need to more fully leverage. And so I'm excited to see the, the pilot that Manassas is doing, um, and hopefully others. Absolutely, and I would even say, you know, working with the state and working with the, the, the businesses to convince the teachers and the parents and even the principals so that these things are available in their high schools because very often, you know, when I talk with freshmen, my son is now a freshman in, in high school, and, you know, and when I talk with some of his, his you know, kids in the school or, or even parents, they don't know that these certifications are available, and it doesn't have to be just trades, it can be many other useful certifications, yeah. or those who have graduated from our local schools, and then I meet them, and they are like, oh my gosh, I have to pay for the certification. I'm like, well, did you know you would have had it for free? No, I didn't. Well, how do they find out about those things? So there's a lot of information coming at them. How can we digest it for them and just make it easy to understand, you know, to Suzanne's point? How can we, you know, collectively, because it does take a village, to just get that information across to them so that they know. I mean, we have, you know, Manassas City, Manassas Park, Prince William here. We can, you know, what can we do collectively to make it easier for the kids to understand that they can take those classes? All right, what's up, Woodbridge? Uh, Prince William, thank you, though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it used to be. Yeah, we used to be. Um, the question, um, how, how are you guys uh, advertising this to the students? I mean, at the schools currently, telling the kids uh, or the freshmen coming in, hey, we have new certification programs that you guys can take by the time you get to be seniors, or are these offer like literally right now as they go into school and say, now you can take a this certification. Uh, do you understand, like, uh, I'm trying to figure out, like, when did it, was this actually known in the schools? I think that's a great question. If some of the school board reps who are here would be uh, better suited to sort of answer what each local jurisdictions doing in terms of education and availability and outreach to any takers? If you could clarify, I think it's, you said it was optional for the uh, districts, school districts, yeah. to choose to do this or not. It's That's not right. mandated. It's not mandated. It's a local option. It's just a tool that they can utilize right. once they get the program in place. So we don't know if any schools that have, have been adopted this yet? Not yet. I mean, it just came into effect July 1, July so this is part of it, it takes localities and superintendents a while to say, okay, here's what it is, you know, how do we adjust to it, how do we adapt, what does it mean? Um, so I expect, you know, as information gets out through the superintendents association, through the school boards association, through others, that's when you'll start to see that um, start to circulate to each of the localities and you'll start to see adoption and, and discussions. But it, you use, with laws like this and changes it usually take a year to 18 months to sort of adapt and I see some heads nodding from and some, some of the staff. And I guess that's because it's more of the top down. I guess you have mm -hmm. those who are of uh, uh, authority have to at least know what's going on to know how to implement it. And we just now starting the school year, so they're probably not aware or yeah. just becoming yeah, aware. Yeah, for, for, for a July 1 switchover mm -hmm. and them starting a new school year is almost impossible to <laughs> get something in place. So it, it will take time for the school systems to At least as a chamber, I mean, we're a large business organization with all its families. You know, thanks a lot to the, the uh, support of um, Eugene and Susanna, we have on our page now um, a fairly extensive page with multiple links all about CTE. I mean, there's no reason why we can't plug in more information to that, but it, we're trying to educate the general public about what CTE is all about and the advantages of it and the, and the real um, benefit for our students in terms of workforce development and employment. So, 
that's at least one thing that we're trying to do here, <laughs> at least doing the chamber, which is at least one conduit. Anyway. Mm -hmm. I was going to add to, I was going to say, the three of you have just said something very important. I think is that's the, the dissemination of that information to other areas, or all areas, not just this county, but worldwide for opportunities like this for people, not just in this, you know, education is important to our families and getting that information safely to people, you know, properly and opportunities where people could, you know, people need a home, you know, and um, they need to be safe there. and 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 learn in a, a positive environment. I mean, for example, when I was at Mason briefly, they didn't offer welding. So I went somewhere in the country and learned to weld. So it was an internship. But at the time, Mason did not have sculpture, for example. Mm. Now they do. But then we have a new campus, you know, with other things. So, I mean, this is, I don't know. This is well, I appreciate, appreciate, I don't want to yep. intrude upon our time on our agenda. <laughs> and I do have to step out a little bit and. So I got a little preview of the <laughs> um, great presentation. So I appreciate everyone's time. Um, feel free to reach out to me with ideas. Um, my cell phone, if you need it, it's available. I have some cards as well. Um, my cell phone is 571-437-2402. you got ideas, ideas, yeah, 571-437-2402. Great ideas come from everywhere, so I'm not the sole person on legislative ideas. Great ideas like these come from listening, talking, and sharing ideas. Uh, many of you have experience in different professional lives that you know have direct impact. So I appreciate uh, your feedback and appreciate the time to come in. Great, thank you for coming. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so welcome to our next speaker, Delena Kamau, who has been with the chamber forever and ever and ever, <laughs> wearing many different hats along, along her journey. Um, she's going to share with us about the Military Child Coalition, which is her latest hat. Eugene Light. Not only can he's the lights, he can help us. You know, he's got many jobs over there. <laughs> 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 All right, well, good morning. Some of you know who I am, but some of you may not have realized that I was a military child. My stepfather was in the Air Force. I, my husband served 25 years in the military, retired sergeant major. All three of my children joined the military. Two are still in. My daughter, Jasmine, Lieutenant Colonel. My son is a Black Hawk pilot, he's CW4. Wow. And my daughter, who's no longer in the military, her husband is, and he's Lieutenant Colonel Promotable at Fort Belvoir. So, and the topper, all seven of my of my children, my grandchildren, are military kids. So I, I don't want to speak. Drink the water. <laughs> Drink the water. Yes, definitely. MSAC, Military Child Education Coalition, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We've been around 20 years. We're a global, uh, global organization. And our main purpose is to ensure that all of our military and veteran connected children receive the same quality education as their civilian counterpart. This right here is a statement that was given by the, the service secretary, the joint memo to the National Governors Association because it's really important to have the quality schools because our military kids move and their next duty station, depending on the school district that they're gonna be moving into, if it's not, if it's questionable, they've chosen to stay at home. I mean, they, they've chosen not to move with their service member. And that could be devastating to the family unit. unit. So in um, the family, let me just get my, my notes here. Thing without the life being on, talk about not having your glasses. <laughs> but uh, Military Family Advisory Network did a survey last year. They interviewed 5,650, they had that many participants, and it was mainly service members and their spouses. Now, what they asked, what they found 46, just almost half of the, those who surveyed were surveyed chose to live apart because they didn't want to have to move their family to an area that was questionable for school. But there were two reasons. 39% was for their children's education, but the other 
percent of that uh, it was for the spouse's employment let me just let me just do a raise of hand how many of you are military past military okay how many of you were military children and grandchildren and grandchildren, and grandchildren. Yeah. okay so you kind of understand what I'm saying when I when I give you the, the stats here but also you know that what was running throughout the survey is the need for family unity when you think about it that really is um, what's going to keep our, our nation safe is to have the family and I can't think of the word that I want to use but uh, it really does help our family and uh, national security that's the one it helps with our national security too because when the service member is not thinking you know he's more or she is more worried about the family back home then it can be um, devastating to that blue star family also did a survey and they did military spouses service members and veterans and the one i'm going to be talking about is our military spouses they too 46 percent decided to live apart then move with their service member and 39 percent was due to the uh, child's education That's what we do, Military Child Education Coalition. We support our military and veteran-connected children because we want to ensure that they are college, workforce, and ultimately life ready. And we do it for the sake of the child, one child at a time. Now, you can read our mission, but through our mission, we have five areas that we work on. One is the educational needs. We want to ensure that our military and veteran connected children, their educational needs are recognized but on a national level. We also want to make sure that our students succeed. And as I mentioned before, we want to make sure that they're, they're college ready, workforce ready, ultimately life ready. Now as uh, Senator McPike just said, not all kids want to, you know, they, not all are going to go to college, but that's okay. That's where that life ready comes in too. And then we have our parents. We want to ensure that our parents receive the information that they need to help their child actually go from school to school to school. We want to empower them to be able to be knowledgeable enough to be able to kind of get through the system to be able to help their child. Because one school district and one state may be different from the other one. And when they're trying to, tra they're trying to get their credits, they may not be able to graduate when they get into um, that last school in their 12th grade, their senior grade. We also work with professionals, educators, to ensure that they understand those challenges that come with being a military child. And then we have our state and local that we, that we try to, to work with, and our chambers, those in the community, because it is important. And I can guarantee you, a lot of those families that come in, they will look at the chamber and just kind of see, you know, what, what, what's, how much of the community is involved. Mm -hmm. And because one thing that, that we are, we were founded on a coalition. So we work together. We work a lot with different organizations, a lot of different nonprofits. I mentioned Blue Star Families <coughs> and also the Military Family Advisory network we work with them uh, we work with chambers so we, we are out there and we educate advocate and collaborate now I just want to mention a lot of the artwork all the artwork in here is from our military kids and uh, we do a, a contest every year and we put it in our calendar I would have had some, but my basement flooded, oh, and they, I will just leave it that way. <laughs> um, but we, we have, all the artwork is here, so it's, and you know, there are nearly, nearly two million military connected kids, sorry. From what area is that, Delina, the two million? It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Nationwide, Nationwide, I assume. Global, CONUS, Global. OCONUS, mm -hmm. overseas, yeah. okay. but two million are military, and then we have over two million parents um, are post 9-11 veterans, wow. and they're just kids, mm -hmm. they are just kids. 
and they all have a unique story. Now, our military kids, they move anywhere between every two to three years. That can translate anywhere from six to nine times they're going to change schools. So that can be hard on them. That can be really hard. And it's kind of funny because, not funny, haha, -ha, but I mean it's strange because in the same family you may have one child succeed and the other child have, have challenges. So it's, it's just different per family. And I just, I love this one. A military child is one who knows how to prepare for the worst but hopes for the best. We all know that service is not something only those in uniform do. I heard Mrs. Pence once say, when I first came working, when I first came on board with MSEC, she said, you know, our military kids may not have participated in the decisions that their parents made to join the military, but they definitely stepped up to the plate and served, and that could not be more true. We have military kids in almost every single zip code. This is a heavy populated area. Sorry, I just didn't realize I was standing in your way. And so these are ages that vary. Now one thing that we have a challenge with, and I was just talking to Senator McPike, is our guard and reserve. It's really hard to identify those kids because you know their parents deploy. Sometimes they deploy just as much as the active component and we cover all branches of service to include our Guard and Reserve, U.S. Coast Guard, and post 9-11 veterans. But, you know, they may not, um, they, they travel, I mean, they, they deploy, but not more than the active component because they may be in Florida working hurricanes, supporting that, or in California fires, or in Afghanistan and Iraq. So they move just as much, but it's hard to identify those kids. And um, I don't have time, but I wanted to talk about the military student identifier. That's one thing that we are working. Um, and this is interesting. About 75% of children are below the age of 13, and over half are ages 5 and younger. And I already talked about how often they move. We cover all brand, I mean, all services. I'm, Sorry, all schools. We have pi public, private, Department of Defense, and homeschool. So we can we can help all those areas. And I just like that. I just love that. Wow. Mm -hmm. And we are, we do, you know, collaborate. That's really important. Now, in your packet, there's our programs. We have um, various programs. We have our student to student program, which covers high school, middle school, and elementary school. It's a very, and, and I'm not going to go into it all the time, but it has it in there. We have our parent to parent. We also have Tell Me a Story. It's a literacy program that we help encourage children to start reading at a young age. And they can also, it's really to help them become resilient because they can read a book about something, you know. The book can be talk about a cat losing its leg. Well, their parent may come home and he or she may be different, may be ill, may not have, you know, may be missing a limb. So there's, there, we do that through literature. We do it through literacy, and we help them try to become more resilient. And then we have our professionals. And there's some different, I brought some different, um, through their professional development, that we have in the packet. And this is our reach. We have it through our student initiatives, parents, professional development. And then the other is through our national training seminar that we just had. And we had we had almost 900 people attend that conference, which was a really big. We also bring our students in, too. Okay. National Training Seminar, we have it every year. It's our annual in, in uh, July. And it is um, in D.C. So it's a really, it's a great event where everyone comes, comes together. Our student to student program teaches leadership, academic service. These are our core values for our student students 100% accepted. 
This is where our student to student program, now student to student program, I should explain it really quickly. It's kind of, um, it's a program that is in the schools and when a new school comes, whether they're civilian or military, they are embraced through our program and it's, it's students leading the way. So it teaches them leadership. And these are all of our schools. And as I mentioned, we're OCONUS, we're in Italy, Guam, Germany, Cuba, Spain. So we're, and this is also, you know, the one thing that I really wanted to stress, these are just different things that kids say. They are just kids. And, you know, my daughter, when my daughter left for Afghanistan, I mean, it was hard. It's hard when dad leaves. It's really, really hard when mom leaves. And I'm just glad I was here at the time to, well, my, my kids were here, but I was able to go and be with, with my grandchildren because it helped, not only did it help them, it helped me. So they are just kids. And, hey, remember just a little bit, but I have, also I wanted to share with you, we do help with the exceptional needs as well, and that's one thing I didn't get to go into, but I do have On The Move magazine, if any of you want this, this is one issue behind and this is our uh, on the move magazine that we have currently the rest are in my basement too but um, <laughs> I have some it has the artwork and it's amazing some of these kids and not all the kids were military some were civilian they brought it into so if you want one please feel free to take one and if anyone doesn't have any questions I have a question so yes. what would you like us to try to do to move forward on the initiative I I understand that when your daughter left, you said my, my, my grandson just went into the Coast Guard and my daughter was like, besides herself, I had to get her massage, you know, I had to send her out some things, head massage. And then my one son was in the Coast Guard, she was out in the Coast Guard, so I, and she was all like distraught for like two days. And I said, you guys don't repeat for that, okay? You know, I'm to deal with But what can we do to help this initiative? Just spread the word. Okay. All of our programs, for those who participate, even our professional, our educators, it's free. It's free. So we just need to get it out there. We just need to get, you know, let people know that we do have this program and it's free. And there's so much information. Just check out our website. And my card is in the. An interesting lead in. I'm going to just take the time one second to mention this. Um, I also work with the Hispanic Council at the Chamber, and one thing we, we collaborate with the Virginia Hispanic Chamber and the Mid Atlantic Hispanic Chamber every year to do this Hispanic Heritage Month celebration at the Hilton Performing Arts Center. It's really very inclusive. We want everybody to be there. But the theme is actually going to have a military focus because it was brought attention to me that 22% of our military are Hispanic. Yeah. I didn't know it was that high. Mm -hmm. wow. So what we decided to do immediately, I said, that's the theme. So that will be our theme, and both of our keynote speakers are veterans. So if any of you, I hope you can come. It's going to be at the Hilton Performing Arts Center. It'll be a lot of fun. You're going to learn about some of the heritage. We'll have some performers, and then we go on stage and have food from all different types of restaurants, and then we'll hear our keynotes. But anyway, I have information here, but I thought that would be a good lead into what we had we just mentioning. So. Because, you know, we come from a region, a very high, you know, um, not only Hispanic, but our military. So, to go together. Thank you, Julia, for being here. Appreciate it. All right, so we're going to move kind of right into our programs. Um, National Young Readers Day is coming up on Wednesday, November 13th. No, 12th. No, 14th. Thank you. <laughs> like, I think it's 14th is in my head, so I'm yes, going to go yes. with that. 14th. Wednesday, November 14th, um, we moved it to a Wednesday from a Tuesday because we are having um, salute to the Armed Forces. Forces on the Tuesday since it's right after Veterans Day. Um, we also thought with the schools being out on that Monday in observance of Veterans Day, it would be better to wait a day, let them get back in the classroom, and then have us all come to read to them mm -hmm. um, versus doing it their first day back after a long weekend. Um, we are still looking for a few more coordinators. Uh, we currently have um, about 45 schools that are in our list. That doesn't mean that that won't go up or down, depending on how the schools respond 
um, over the next week or so. Um, but we are looking for some more coordinators so we don't have coordinators having seven schools. We like to keep it to two to three schools at the most. Um, if you're a business and are interested in reading for National Young Readers Day or better yet, adopting a school and having everybody from your office come out and read, um, please let me know um, if you have a school that you'd like to work with or have worked with traditionally. Um, that makes sense and we can connect the dots for you and help work through a coordinator to make that happen. A um, little background, National Young Readers Day, this committee as well as the rest of the chamber and whoever else we can drag off the street to go read the kids. Um, marches into all the, as many elementary schools as we can in Prince William County, Manassas, MNSS uh, Park to read to the elementary school students and share the joy of reading um, because we felt that literacy um, is obviously very important but having a connection with the business community early on and letting them understand that there's this big thing called the chamber that at some point in their life they may become involved in. It's great to get that out there early on so that they have that in their minds as they grow up and go through school. Um, so if you are interested in being a coordinator, it's not as scary as it sounds. If you're interested in being a reader or if you would like to adopt a school as a business, please let me know. Um, I kind of manage the chaos. Um, and I have many coordinators. If you're a coordinator in the room, could you please raise your hand so everybody kind of knows they can talk to you about reading at your schools as well. Is there a sheet we can pass around if anybody wants to volunteer as a reader perhaps? Sure, right here. Yeah. It's a nice blank yeah. sign-in awesome. sheet. Awesome. Feel free to write all over it on the back as well. <laughs> I'll put on your readers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, next up is Speed Networking. And <coughs> Speed Networking is an event that we coordinate with the local high schools. Usually it's the FBLA, DECA, or the business department within the schools. And what we do is we work with the student team to plan and organize this event. They are looking to build soft skills that they don't necessarily have the opportunity to cover in their classroom. So it is networking. We go in and network with the students, teach them about different um, you know, how to have a good handshake, how to make a good first impression, how to make eye contact, how to present yourself and uh, give your little 30 second introduction of who you are and what you're looking to do. Um, some groups will go and do a resume to hand out. Some groups have made business cards. Um, some groups have, um, you know, had a list of questions that they want answered during the networking sessions for the presenters to talk about. Um, but you're really interacting with a group of about eight to ten students at a time and then you rotate. Um, the last two years we've done it at Freedom High School. Um, what is becoming increasingly challenging for me is that the um, contacts of the schools change quite frequently and it's very difficult sometimes for me to find them on the website of who to contact. Um, who's the FALA director or you know um, liaison for the students who is the DECA person, who is the business department chair, who do I need to contact at the schools? Because every school, it, I know they're site-based management, but when you're a business trying to figure out who to contact, it gets like a little, a little crazy. So those of you in the school system, if you have the magic formula to navigate that, I would appreciate that. Um, because my, my thing is I want to get the information to the school so that then they have the opportunity to respond. It's a really great learning tool for the students because they plan this event from the start to the finish. They run the event. I only mentor them. I give them kind of a template to work from and then mentor them through the process of planning a major event. We help them fill in the volunteer spots, but I mean, they go out and they ask for donations from food vendors. They figure out the logistics. They work with school administration to figure out how you know, where, where are people going to park that day? What happens if it's a snow day? Who's the communications director? They do all the marketing. They set up a sign-up website. We do everything with them. So they have a lot of hands-on knowledge of planning a major event, um, which incorporates a lot of different skills. Any of you who have planned an event, even just a simple kid's birthday party, know that there are a lot of moving parts when you're trying to run an event. So it, I think it's an important skill that they get this um, experience during high school when they can then take that into a number of different professions um, later on. So I haven't sent out the email yet to any of the schools, which is why I'm making the plea for you guys to get me how I can get that out to them. 
Um, but we are open to doing two in a year. We have only been doing one in a year, but we would like to be able to do one on the east end, one on the west end of the county to give multiple schools the opportunity to do so. Um, we prefer to have about a three month lead time if possible, but sometimes that's been only a month and a half, um, depending on it. And we can work with whatever time frame there is. Um, obviously, just we go into it saying, okay, so we have a month and a half. Here's, the thing, here's, your, here's your timeline. These are the things that need to happen. Um, and we set up targets and everything based on when we set the dates. What questions do we have about speed networking? What, what is the first one we have coming up? Is that going to be December like last year or do we have one set up at all? I don't have one set up at okay. all. Okay. Okay. I know it was great. I was participated the last yeah. two years. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I know there's some contingencies with FBLA and DECA. They have um, <coughs> national competitions that they like to get their stuff in for and I believe the deadline somewhere in December before they go to break. So that's oftentimes why they will do it early, which I'm fine with. If, if a school wants to jump in and say, yes, this, we want this, let's do it, then we can make that happen. We just have to get the dates on the calendar um, you know, pretty soon so we can get that blocked off with the school and start promoting it in the chamber. All right. Okay. So on to workforce development. Are you ready, Eugene and Susanna? Or um, if not, we can go on to the next. No, actually, I mean, I am ready, I guess. You are ready? Okay. okay. Can everybody see the screen? Because if not, we can do the switch again. Yeah. She's on it. That's the other one. There you go. Thank Got it. you. Okie So, um, Suzanne had mentioned earlier that um, we, as a committee from the innovation side, we developed a landing page. <coughs> In, re in regards to career and technical education. And the whole point behind this uh, landing page was to create an umbrella where everyone here in our three school divisions can actually work together along with the businesses in our community and vice versa for them to work within the schools. And last year, we focused a lot on career and technical education to be able to help guide the, uh, the business community into understanding some of these public sector terms that we may not be as familiar with. And one of the things that Suzanne and I, uh, Susanna and I wanted to focus on is that there's four areas that a youth should be exposed to before they graduate from school. Uh, higher education is obviously what we always deal with when we're dealing with the school. But workforce development and military and entrepreneurship kind of rounds out the other three. But one of the things that she and I wanted to focus on was, again, standing for career technical education and introducing that to the community, which we were able to do last year. This year, we're focusing on career clusters, which is now a, more of the next level, to be able to connect the businesses that come from the 16 pathways, uh, 16 career clusters, and the 79 pathways, which you obviously see through the, um, the, the handout that I gave you. You guys can get a chance to look at that. But one of the things that uh, we wanted to do was focus on getting businesses into the schools, but in classroom support. And then we also wanted to create a component for the students to have applied knowledge or, or, or uh, information out of the classroom. So what work-based learning, if you guys take a look at the other sheet, uh, the, the flip page, it should look just like this. What you'll see is uh, through work-based learning, there's three areas that we, that we uh, which is the Department of Education. Uh, they have three areas, career exploration, free professional, and the career preparation. As a committee, we're focusing on two areas, which would have been job shadowing, which is going to be primarily for grades six to eight, that's middle school. And then we also have cooperative education, which is going to be for the higher, the uh, older students in um, 11th to 12th grade with more of the out of classroom. So with work-based learning, uh, which is under CTE, uh, what we wanted to do was we focused on middle schools first, because again, that's kind of like the donut hole. There's a lot of resources for high school, and there's a lot of resources for, middle, uh, for elementary. Middle school is a little bit left um, in this, this, this mixed bag, so we wanted to focus on establishing career fairs and getting the businesses who we have here from in the chamber or within the community to help with in-classroom construction with those students. But what we have is here <clears throat> is when we're dealing with the uh, older students and we're coming into cooperative education, we want those businesses to find their diamond in the rough, pretty much, 
and then being allowing that student to have some out of classroom instruction. To kind of give you an idea of how this uh, works, uh, I wanted to show you through the city of Manassas um, and their CTE department. Uh, one of the things that made it easy for the two of us is that we've had some uh, work within the city of Manassas. Uh, obviously, it's one high school and you know, not as much um, uh, of a challenge to say maybe starting with the county. So we went with Leaf Paths of Resistance to start some of our initiatives as a small uh, component and then trying to grow within the county. So one of the things that we have here is uh, we actually have, for, the, for a couple years back, the city of Manassas went through a, a daunting challenge to become a governor's STEM academy. And pretty much what that does is allow students in the STEM area to be able to uh, seek employment as well as career opportunities for in that, the, in that area. And the three areas that we focused on was facility and maintenance, I forget what that one is. And if you look at the career clusters, you'll see it's not cut and dry that every 16 cluster, you have to fall into that pathway, some overlap. So you'll see on the back end, transportation and logistics, uh, facility, maintenance, I believe that's in there. That's one of the areas that we have to stem. And when you think of academy, it's pretty much like the, the clusters that's going to be uh, multiple, it's either one or multiple clusters kind of operating under the same roof. If you see uh, network systems and cybersecurity, that's going to fall under IT. And then we also have uh, the last one, which I believe is for STEM. It's, it's under the STEM. It's, um, I don't have that in front of me. But the last one that we have here is, where is STEM? Uh, yes, yeah, STEM, engineering and technology. So those are the three pathways that we have. Now staying within that, CTE encompasses STEM, not the other way around. That's why it's called career and technical education. There's 22 governor schools, uh, uh, 22 academies here in the state of Virginia, and we were fortunate through the work with the city of Manassas in this daunting task to be able to get the city of Manassas to also have uh, the academy. But when you, roll, when you scroll down here through CTE, the, while this was happening, while we were working on that, I was working with the city of Manassas to help where they were setting up the four academies that they're concentrating within their division. Business and finance, here STEM and IT, which is again the wraparound from the governor's schools there. And these are the different courses that a student's going to be uh, enrolled in under that cluster. And the goal for us is to connect the businesses in these professions to these courses to help the students get the applied knowledge to the book knowledge that they're getting there. You see HVAC was something that's also there. Health and Human Services, again, these are pathways that we call academies, and these are what you, I guess you would say the clusters in these individual uh, pathways, and then we have Arts and Humanities. And the reason why we uh, wanted to focus on these areas <coughs> is because what's happening is through work base, we wanted to get the students from the job shadowing at the lower level to actually show where their interests may be. And then as they got a little bit older and finding this is probably the area, they can fall into those pathways or those clusters to gotta get a little bit more of the support from the book knowledge. But what we, were, we, we all discovered is that they need the wraparound service from the business community for the supply knowledge so that way they know this is what they want to do if they want to go into the workforce or if they want to go into higher education under that field just to give them a little bit more of that wraparound. So what we're doing right now is we also have through the second component on uh, career exploration is uh, youth registered apprentice which is something that we're now coming out from in the county. This is now out of classroom. So these are the students who actually found this is where I would <coughs> like to be and these are, the, these are the pathways that I would like to choose and we want to get the businesses to be able to connect with those individuals. But one of the areas, but one of the concerns that we wanted to address when we were establishing this, this component was how is the student going to get there and who's going to pay for it? Because again, this is going to be something when we announce this to the community, because we're coming up, at, we just a uh, couple weeks back, both groups, the city of Manassas and Manassas, uh, excuse me, uh, the county, 
They have what they have like a business luncheon or secondary day where all of the teachers in CTE, middle and high school, they before the school year starts, they come together and kind of discuss with maybe the businesses amongst the division to see how they're going to project themselves moving forward. Because of us setting up the landing page and working with our divisions and our foundations, we were able to create this, this, this camaraderie from top down. Now we're trying to connect with the teachers at the ground level because that's really where we want the businesses to be connected to. That's how they're going to be connected to the student, is through the teacher. So we're trying to now connect with the teachers to be able to utilize our committee, any work-based relation, uh, any work-based or workforce development initiative to contact our committee so that way we can be able to provide those support resources to that classroom. What's happening right now is we are trying to figure out how we're going to get that student to the employer. So working with the three foundations, uh, we uh, was able to establish a transportation account with the city of Manassas first, and then we'll get into the county and so forth, uh, which will allow funding, which we call Adopt the School, funding to go into the foundations, allowing the student to be able to get to and from, coming from the community at large and the business community. And one of the things that's happening right now is I'm, I'm setting up some funding from a major company uh, here who happens to have an office in our area, and I'm working to bring that down from the federal level down to the local. Some folks have the coolest ringtone, so it's always embarrassing when it's yours that goes out and everybody has to listen to it, so I want to listen to that. But uh, what, what we have right now is I'm working through our uh, congressional leaders right now to be able to attach that funding through them to be able to announce this to the community. So. That's the reason why I have my good friend De Dave Stegmeyer here, because I'm working through his office with Barbara Comstock and some of our other congressional leaders here, because they represent Manassas City, Manassas Park. Uh, and then we have our two other congressional leaders, Congressman Whitman, who's Western Prince William, and then Jerry Connolly, who's Eastern Prince William. So what we're doing right now is trying to set up through career clusters, getting the businesses to come into the schools through CTE, because we have the links to our three school division. Just kind of finishing up, just saying that right now what we're doing as a committee is working to get our businesses into the classroom and then also through our divisions. So that's what the landing page is about. Over the course of the year, we're gonna be focusing on career clusters, so kind of get familiar with this and how we can get those clusters from our businesses and where you know where you fall connected to our three school divisions. And that way you'll be able to um, find where your home may be, whether it's through work-based learning, you want to get into the classroom, or you want to go into the uh, youth residency <coughs> apprenticeship component, which would be for the out-of-classroom experience. So uh, just kind of look forward to a great year that we have. We hope that you guys continue to build with us. And um, thanks again a little bit for the time. Thank you. Quickly. What? No, I think we're good. So you, you, will, you will just hear, there, there are some events already scheduled right. at local middle schools and high schools and you will get information either at our future meetings or Suzanne okay, will kindly yep. send them out. Just I know uh, Osborne High School, you know, in the Governor's STEM Academy, they are setting up different donuts with engineers, donuts with trades, donuts with business, donuts with, you know, different areas that are included in some of these career clusters. I know Manassas Park and Prince William, uh, they will also, their, their schools will be organizing some of these events where we all can go, we can send our colleagues from the different uh, backgrounds and careers so that they can help connect with the students. So please stay tuned and see where you can plug yourselves in or your colleagues because that is something that many of us, well, all, all of our businesses, they stand and fall by the workforce that we have. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.